Part 2 of Path to Shiva consists of lessons 24 through 46. Path to Shiva, Lesson 24 Are souls and world essentially good? All souls are essentially good, for their inner nature is divine. Each soul is created by God Shiva from himself. Shiva's nature is pure love, so goodness, compassion, understanding, and joy are natural qualities of the soul. Wisdom and pure knowledge are the intrinsic nature of the soul. The world, too, is God's flawless creation. All is in perfect order and balance. Since God is everywhere and in all things, there can be no place for evil. Evil is often looked upon as a force against God, but we know that all forces are God's forces, even mean hurtful actions. This is sometimes difficult to understand when we see the pains and problems caused by people against each other. Looking deeper, we see that what is called evil has its own purpose in life. Yes, bad things do happen. Still, the wise never blame God for they know such things are the return of our self-created karmas, tough lessons that help us learn and mature. The nature of the world is duality. Each contains each thing and its opposite, joy and sorrow, goodness and evil, love and hate. Suffering cannot be totally avoided. It is a natural part of human life that causes much spiritual growth for the soul. Knowing this, the wise accept suffering from any source, be it hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, famine, wars, disease, or personal tragedies. Suffering offers us the important realization that true happiness and freedom cannot be found in the world. For earthly joy is bound to sorrow. Having learned this, devotees seek a Satguru who teaches them to overcome suffering through understanding and acceptance. The world is the bountiful creation of a benevolent God who means for us to live positively in it, facing karma and fulfilling dharma. We must not despise or fear the world. Life is meant to be lived joyously. Path to Shiva, Lesson 25 What about evil, hell, and sin? In the highest sense, there is no good or bad. God did not create evil as a force distinct from good. He granted to souls the divine laws of dharma and karma along with the freedom to act as they wish in the great ocean of experience. This is God's grace, allowing us to learn and evolve. There is no eternal hell, nor is there a Satan. However, there are hellish states of mind and painful births for those who think and act wrongfully. Sin is related only to the lower instinctive intellectual nature as a transgression of Dharma. Man's true nature is not sullied by sin and no bad deed can cause the soul to be forever lost or damned. Still, wrongful actions are real and to be avoided for they return to us as sorrow through the law of karma. Bad deeds can be atoned for with sadhana, worship, and penance. As Saivites, we do not see a sharp contrast of good and evil in the world. Instead, we understand that all people have a threefold nature. Instinctive, intellectual, 
and spiritual. The instinctive nature is the outer, lower, or animal nature of I, me, and mine. When it dominates, people become angry, fearful, greedy, jealous, and hurtful. The intellectual nature is the soul's mental aspect. When it rules, people can become arrogant and prone to argument and conflict. The spiritual or superconscious nature of the soul is the source of compassion, insight, modesty, peace, and understanding. The animal instincts of young souls are strong. Their intellect, which is needed to control the instincts, is yet to be developed. When we encounter meanness and wickedness in others, we recall this threefold nature and have compassion for those in the lower instinctive states. We know they will continue to evolve as they learn from their self-created karma. We also know there is no intrinsic evil. Path to Shiva, Lesson 26. Who is Lord Ganesha? Lord Ganesha is the elephant-faced patron of art and science, the lord of obstacles and guardian of Dharma. First son of Shiva, he is worshipped before any of the other gods, including Shiva himself. His vahana or mount is Mushika, the mouse, symbol of this god's ability to access all places in the mind. Gurudeva taught, wherever his devotees are, in the home, the factories, the offices, the hospitals, the marketplace, Orbiting in space or tilling the soil on the farm, Lord Ganesha is ever there. We worship him before beginning a new project, taking an exam, or making a major decision such as where to go to college. When we feel the need for Ganesha's blessings, we attend puja to him in the temple or pray to him at our home shrine. You can get to know him as a good friend. To contact him, hold his elephant image in your mind. Look into his eyes. Speak your questions and problems into his right ear. When you are finished, open your eyes. Ganesha's guidance will come in a subtle, indirect manner. Over the next several days, watch for signs, perhaps a suggestion or even a casual comment from a teacher, parent or friend that suddenly makes it clear what you should do. The Shakti of Lord Ganesha is a gentle, soothing force. Even a subtle encounter has the power to bring us into the secure consciousness of the Muladhara Chakra, the force center of memory where Ganesha resides. This blessing keeps us above the seven lower chakras, home of the base emotions such as jealousy, fear, and anger. Lord Shiva, the Supreme God, created Lord Ganesha, Murugan, and all the other Hindu gods. They are souls like us, but of a higher evolution, destined to enjoy union with him. They are very old and mature souls, mighty beings who live in the Shiva Loka. Though commonly depicted as male or female, they are actually beyond gender. <clears throat> Path to Shiva, Lesson 27. Who is Lord Murugan? Murugan is the god of religion and yoga. He is the second son of Shiva, born of his divine mind. His electric power awakens spiritual wisdom to propel souls onward in their evolution to Shiva's feet. 
also known as Kartikeya, Kumara, Skanda, Shanmukhanada, and Subramanya. He is worshipped not only by Hindus, but by Buddhists as well in China, Japan, and other countries. Majestically seated on the Manipura Chakra, this red-hued god blesses mankind and strengthens our will when we rise to higher consciousness through sadhana and yoga. He brings detachment, willpower, and contentment, and his blessings strengthen our meditations. Lord Murugan carries a veil or spear, representing the power to overcome darkness and ignorance. He is the authority behind the king, nowadays any government which rules the people, there to see that justice is done and peace prevails. Murugan is especially loved by Tamil Saivites who believe he guides their culture and history. Devotees look to him for healing of the body and mind and for strength to face life's challenges. He is said to love bamboo groves and hilltops and his vahana is the proud and beautiful peacock. When we connect with Murugan, we have to be ready to change, for he brings a dynamic energy. He inspires penance, such as carrying cavity during Thai Pusam, which softens karmas and purifies the mind. When Murugan's blessings come into our life, we become a better person, more kind, disciplined, and spiritual. Many saints and devotees have had visions of Murugan and other gods, but more often we just sense their presence as we feel the warm rays of the sun when our eyes are closed. Path to Shiva, Lesson 28. What is Bhakti? Bhakti is devotion or love felt toward God, gods, and guru. Bhakti yoga, the practice of expressing this love, is strong in most Hindu traditions. We express bhakti when we worship in our home shrine, attend the temple, or travel on pilgrimage. The more we experience devotion, the more it grows within us. This occurs when we sing sacred songs and chant bhajans. Listening to stories of our great saints and satgurus inspires bhakti. In Saiba Siddhanta, bhakti yoga is never outgrown. It is not just for beginners. As Gurudeva said, the yoga of pure devotion is found at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the path. By awakening this love and appreciation, we open ourselves to God's grace. We also express bhakti toward our guru as a way to experience his or her blessings and grace. Devotion is a calm, intelligent expression of love for the deity. It is not unlike the closeness felt between good friends. In Saiva Siddhanta, the path begins at the Charya stage with getting to know the gods and developing a relationship with them through service or karma yoga. Then bhakti is naturally experienced. This is the Kriya stage. Our nature becomes soft, flexible, and content. Gurudeva explained, the inner knowing that all is Shiva's will is one of the first benefits of bhakti yoga. A close loving relationship with God and the gods gives us a great stability in life and allows for success in meditation. If problems or negative karmas arise, the devotee can place them at the feet of the deity to be dissolved. When karmas are clear, the devotee is able to internalize his devotion into deeper meditations in the yoga stage. Path to Shiva, Lesson 29. Who are the Devas? 
Gurudeva wrote, Religion is the bringing together of the three worlds. This means that the ascended masters, angels, devas, deities, saints, sages of each of the world's religions, living without physical bodies in the inner worlds, guide and govern, help and protect, shower forth blessings, and inspiration to the members of their religious family. As a Saivite, you are part of a large and wonderful global family with members in all three worlds. The devas are beings of light, souls living in the higher level of the second world, Antar Loka, who assist God and the gods. One of their duties is to help answer the prayers of devotees. Another is to receive newcomers to the inner world, those who have died, helping them adjust to their new life without a physical body. Each Hindu has special guardian devas. They are assigned shortly after birth at the name-giving ceremony or later in life when one enters the great tribe known as the Hindu religion. Some devas are attached to individuals and families for many generations. Each family has numerous guardian devas who bless the home and keep the spiritual vibration strong. Some are drawn from nearby temples, attracted by the pujas performed in the home shrine. Still others are from far-off temples who return with the family after the yearly pilgrimage to help in many ways. If the family neglect their sadhana and pujas, however, the home loses its spiritual power and the devas begin to slowly drift away. The devas guard us in the home silently and are seldom seen though their presence in our lives is quite obvious in the form of good happenings and harmony. Path to Shiva, Lesson 30. What are the Path's Four Stages? When created by Lord Shiva, the soul is young and immature. Its process of growing up over many lifetimes happens in four stages. This is much like the development of a lotus flower. First it sends its roots into the pond's mud, then it grows a stem and leaves that reach the water's surface. Finally it blossoms in the full sun, yet each previous stage of growth is still there supporting the flower. Shiva's grace guides this process so that we learn and grow toward the light through experience, under the divine law of karma. As the soul progresses through each stage, it becomes less instinctive and more spiritual. Shiva is continually creating souls, so at any point in time, there are on the earth young souls, adolescent souls, middle-aged souls, and old souls. The four padas, stages of maturation are Charya, Kriya, Yoga, and Jnana. Charya is good conduct and humble service, attending the temple and helping with temple chores. Here the main work is harnessing the instincts and developing virtuous qualities. Kriya is the stage of devotion or love of God expressed through home puja and temple worship. Yoga is the period of meditation and inner striving under a guru's guidance. At this stage, the temple is a sacred space for contemplation as Shiva's veiling power gives way to his revealing grace. Jnana is the wisdom state where the realized soul sees himself as one with the temple deity. These stages are also experienced in each lifetime. As children, we learn good conduct as summarized in the Yamas and Niyamas. Then we are taught worship, expressing heart-melting devotion for God, gods, and Guru. Next, we may learn to meditate with the goal of gaining true wisdom. The four padas are not alternate ways, but progressive steps on a one path called Sanmarga. Nor does the soul give up the practices of one pada when it enters the next. Thus the mature soul in jnana is a paragon of wisdom, yoga, devotion, and virtue. The greatest yogis still love and worship Shiva.
Path to Shiva, Lesson 31. What is Karma? God Shiva creates the cosmos and he resides within it. His many special laws or systems are at work within our complex universe. The law that creates an object to fall to the earth we call gravity. The law that governs the reaction of thoughts, words, and deeds we call karma. It is an automatic system of divine justice. By this law, what we sow, we will reap. Actions and the fruit of action are both called karma. There are three kinds of karma. The karma of all deeds done in our past lives. The karmas we bring into this birth to experience and the karmas we are making by our actions now. Good, helpful thoughts, words, and deeds bring good karma to us in the future. Hurtful actions bring back to us painful karma. Doing bad is like planting poison ivy. Doing good is like planting delicious mangoes. Understanding the law of karma gives us the power to act wisely and create a positive future. Gurudeva said, You are the writer of your own destiny, the master of your ship through life. He meant that karma is not fate. It can be overcome. Through understanding the effects of their actions, individuals sooner or later learn to refrain from committing misdeeds. This is what we mean by saying karma is our teacher. It teaches us to refine our behavior. Even difficult karma helps us grow by teaching us the painful results of unwise actions. No matter how well we understand karma, facing it bravely is still a challenge. Our ego gets in the way, our emotions are stirred, and we react without thinking. Such weakness can be overcome by perfecting our character according to the yamas and niyamas. The effects of karma can be softened in several ways. By accepting and not reacting, by doing penance, by performing good deeds that balance the not so good we have done, and by seeking the grace of God and Guru. Karma applies not only to individuals but to groups, communities, and nations. Past to Shiva, Lesson 32. What is Dharma? When God creates the universe, he, she endows it with order, with the laws to govern creation. Dharma is that divine law prevailing on every level of existence, from the sustaining cosmic order to religious and moral laws that bind us in harmony with that order. It is goodness, ethical practice, and duty. It is the path which leads us to liberation. Dharma is at work on four levels of our existence, universal, human, social, and personal. Universal Dharma rules the natural world, from subatomic quantums to galactic clusters. Social Dharma governs society. Human Dharma guides life's four stages. Personal Dharma is your own perfect pattern in life. It is determined by your past karmas and how the other three dharmas impact you. The key to discovering and understanding your personal Dharma is to worship Lord Ganesha. He knows our past lives and can clarify our right path in life. Gurudeva wrote, 
When we follow this unique pattern guided by Guru, wise elders, and the knowing voice of our soul, we are content and at peace with ourselves and the world. As a youth, a big part of your dharma is to be a good student and a good daughter or son. It is your parents' dharma to care for you. It is your teacher's dharma to teach you. It is the dharma of the police to protect you. As an adult, you may become a parent, and it will then be your dharma to raise and support your family. Later, as an elder, your dharma will be to guide the younger generations. Yoga Swami said that dharma is like the tracks of a train, and like the train we must stay on the tracks to reach our destination. Dharma is so important that the Sanskrit name of Hinduism is Sanatana Dharma, the eternal path. Path to Shiva, Lesson 33, What is Reincarnation? Reincarnation is the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. Each soul has many lifetimes on earth. In each life we drop off our physical body at death, but our inner self, our soul, never dies. We just leave our physical body and go on thinking, feeling, and acting in our astral body. We also do this when we sleep, but we return to our body each time we wake up. At death, we don't come back into our physical body. We leave the physical plane and remain conscious in the inner worlds. After some time, we are born again as a baby in a new physical body with a new mother and father, a new name, and a new future. This return to the physical plane in a new body is called reincarnation. Memories of our previous lifetimes fade away during childhood, though some adults can remember them. We eventually die again because of illness, old age, or an accident. Again, we step out of the physical body and go on living in our astral body. This happens repeatedly. Sometimes we are born as a boy, sometimes as a girl. The way we live in this life determines what our next life will be like. Reincarnation is like a great school and each life is a classroom. Who is learning and growing in the school of life? You, your immortal soul, you have lived many lives. Each lifetime is but one stride on the great journey of your soul. When all the needed lessons have been learned, your soul has matured, all karmas have been resolved, and you have realized God, you will not need to be born again. This is called liberation or moksha, the destiny of all souls without exception. Path to Shiva, Lesson 34. How do we prepare for death? Our rishis and holy scriptures assure us that death is a blissful, light-filled transition from one state to another. As simple and natural as changing clothes, it is not a horrid experience to be feared. In fact, ancient sages call death man's most exalted experience. Our soul never dies, only the physical body dies. We neither dread death nor look forward to it, for we know that life, death, and the afterlife are all part of our path to perfect oneness with God. Death is a quick transition from the physical world to the astral plane. 
like walking through a door, leaving one room and entering another. If we are blessed with the knowledge that our transition may be soon, we fulfill obligations so that we have nothing on our mind except our sadhanas. We make amends and resolve differences with others, forgiving and letting go of conflicts of the past so that we are free of guilt and worry and don't carry these karmas into future births. We also execute our will, distributing our possessions and duties, not leaving these tasks to others. Then we turn to God through meditation, japa, and study of our holy teachings. Many Hindus go to sacred places to make their great departure, as it is called. Varanasi is the most famous for this. It is ideal to be conscious and clear of mind at the time of death. Therefore, we minimize the use of drugs and heroic efforts to keep the body alive. When nearing transition, if hospitalized, we return home to be among loved ones. In the final hours of life, we seek the self-God within and focus on our mantra while family keep prayerful vigil. At death, we seek the grace of God Shiva as we strive to leave the body through the crown chakra at the top of the head, entering the clear white light and beyond in quest of liberation. Bhafta Shiva, Lesson 35 Why is the Satguru so important? Anyone hoping to climb Mount Everest would be wise to have a Sherpa by his side, a guide who has been where you want to go. Similarly, as we walk the spiritual path, we should not be without a Satguru, an enlightened master who knows truth and can take us there. The word guru means teacher. Anyone you are studying with may be called a guru, such as a dance guru, music guru, or a classroom teacher. A teacher is important in any area of study because it is difficult for us to see our own weaknesses, but easy for a trained expert. Your mother and father are your first gurus. Many Hindus have a Sat Guru, a teacher of Sat, or truth. A Sat Guru is a mature soul who has realized God and is able to lead others along the path. Shiva is within each of us, shining out through our eyes. But Shiva shines out from the Sat Guru more brightly, because he or she is pure and enlightened. Thus we worship the Sat Guru as Shiva himself. The Satguru is devoted full time to religious life, to upholding Saivism and helping his devotees. Just by living and being, he or she brings peace and blessings to the world. The Satguru is always a sannyasin, one who is unmarried and has renounced all possessions, personal life, family and friends. A rare initiation from his guru empowered him with the highest spiritual knowledge and authority. This is Shiva's revealing grace, Anugraha Shakti, in action. If your family has a Satguru to guide it, you are indeed fortunate. He can wisely advise your parents and keep the family strong, harmonious, and spiritually alive. Get to know him. Talk to him and ask questions. He will share his wisdom and help you draw close to God. Pastor Shiva, Lesson 36. What is our heritage of gurus? Since the beginning of time, the power or shakti of God Shiva has been carried forth from enlightened beings, Satgurus. That power is like a brilliant ray of spiritual energy. Many of these masters trained other great souls and passed on their power to them. As this happened again and again for thousands of years, many chains of gurus, called parampara, were formed. 
Our lineage is called the Kailasa Parampara. It means the lineage from Shiva's Himalayan mountain, Kailas. It began thousands of years ago. The first master that history records is Maharishi Nandinada. He passed his power to Rishi Tirumular, a sage who wrote a yoga text called Tirumandaram. After him, over 150 rishis carried the Shakti of Shiva forward, their names lost to history. In the 19th century, a nameless Himalayan rishi of this lineage traveled to Bengaluru in South India. There he passed the thread of power to Kadait Swami and sent him to Sri Lanka to strengthen Saivism there. Kadait Swami passed his power to sage Chellapa Swami. He in turn initiated Sakguru Yoga Swami. In 1949, Yoga Swami ordained our Gurudeva, Sivaya Subramunya Swami. Gurudeva brought Saivism to the West and established Kauai Adinam, his monastery, on the Hawaiian island of Kauai in 1970. In 2001, he initiated Bodhinatha Valen Swami as his successor. The power from all previous gurus and the blessings of the devas that assist them abide in the current preceptor. Path to Shiva, Lesson 37. What are the two paths? In Hindu society, there are two ways to live our adult life. We call them the two paths. Most people follow the family path. A rare few follow the monastic path. A married couple has great responsibilities. They create and run a home together. They raise their children as spiritual, well-educated citizens of their nation. They provide support to the young, the aged, and the monastic community. The Tudukaral summarizes, the foremost duty of family life is to serve duly these five, God, guests, kindred, ancestors, and oneself. Married life begins with the wedding ceremony, where vows are taken to be faithful and follow Dharma for life. Monastics follow a different path. Instead of having a spouse and children, they embrace the whole world as their family. They have two goals, to serve humanity and realize God. They renounce name and fame. Their focus is worship, meditation, and yoga, which makes them pure and wise. They inspire and uplift those on the householder path. Some wander or live alone, and others join monasteries. Some are dynamic teachers, some are swamis with many followers, and others are unheralded hermits. In Saivism, most monastics are men, but there are also orders for women. Monastic life begins with vows to stay unmarried and celibate, devoted to God, gods, and guru. Most Hindu monks wear orange robes, others wear white or yellow robes. Some shave their heads while others have long hair and beards. The Tidukaral praises both paths. Behold those who have weighed the dual nature of things and followed the renunciate's way. Their greatness illumines the world. Domestic life is rightly called virtue. The monastic path, rightly live beyond blame, is likewise good. The key is to choose your path carefully and follow it faithfully. Path to Shiva, Lesson 38 Who are our holy men and women? Saivism has many holy men and women. All are great devotees of Shiva, Murugan, and Ganesha. We honor living holy ones on their birthday, or Jayanti. Those who have left this earth we revere on the day of their passing, 
or Mahasamadhi, their new birthday. Saints reflect the peace, humility, and purity of a devout life. Sages are great souls who may outwardly appear ordinary. Satgurus are enlightened beings who guide others on the path. Holy men and women, married people, as well as gurus, sadhus, and swamis, have stood strong for Saivism at critical times throughout history. Many traveled widely and spread Saivite culture and knowledge to new areas. Some were solitary mystics meditating and performing yoga. Some wrote scriptures or composed beautiful songs to God that we sing today. Our lineage began over 2,000 years ago with Maharishi Nandi Nada, a yoga master from Kashmir. His disciple Sundara Nada, later known as Rishi Tirumular, traveled by foot to South India to teach Saivism. Our many gurus followed from him. Other Saivite traditions include that of Matsendra Nada and his disciple Goraksha Nada, who expounded Hatha Yoga and spread Nada Saivism through central India and Nepal. The many women saints include the austere yogini Karakal Amayar and the beloved saint Avayar, whose poems children study to learn religion and good conduct. Among the most famous Tamil Saiva saints are the Nalvars, who kept Saivism strong in Tamil Nadu 12 centuries ago. Path to Shiva, Lesson 39. Who were the four great Tamil saints? The Nalvars are four Saiva saints who lived in Tamil Nadu around 1200 years ago. Each composed devotional songs that are sung today in satsangs and temples. Their names are Appar, Sundarar, Sambandar, and Manika Vasagar. All are deeply revered by Tamil Saivites. St. Tirunavukaras are known as Appar, father, traveled from temple to temple worshiping Shiva. He chose the humblest of work, sweeping the temple walks and weeding the stone courtyards. St. Sundarar is known for his deep visions of Lord Shiva and for several miraculous events that occurred in his life. A poor man, he often prayed for money or food for his family. His prayers were always answered. The third saint, Sambandar, was just three years old when he was blessed with a vision of Lord Shiva, after which he spontaneously sang his first song. He traveled throughout South India, sometimes with Appar, his elder, singing the praises of Shiva. At age 16, his family arranged for him to be married, but this was not to be. He was so devoted to Shiva that just before the wedding, he disappeared into the sanctum of Tirunallur Peruman Shiva Temple near Chidambaram and was never seen again. The songs of the first three saints are called Devarams. Manika Vasagar, the fourth Navar, was prime minister to the Pandian king of Madurai. One day he was blessed with enlightenment and a vision of Lord Shiva sitting under a banyan tree. After this he left the royal court and traveled about, composing songs and building a temple for Shiva at Turuperundurai. His poems stress the importance of the Namah Shivaya mantra, developing dispassion and cultivating love of Lord Shiva. His highly poetic hymns are found in two collections, Tiruvasagam and Tirukovayar. Pass to Shiva, Lesson 40. What is our code of conduct? The Yamas and Niyamas are the Hindu code of conduct. Heeding the ten Yamas, or restraints, keeps our instinctive nature in check. 
abiding by the ten niyamas. Observances makes us more religious and cultured, revealing our refined soul nature. The yamas and niyamas provide the foundation to support our yoga practice and sustain us from day to day and year to year on the path to Shiva. The ten yamas are ahimsa, non-injury, do not harm others by what you do, say, or think, even in your dreams. Live a kindly life, never causing fear, pain, or injury. See God in everyone. Follow a vegetarian diet. Satya, truthfulness. Speak only what is true, kind, helpful, and necessary. Be true to your promises. Don't keep secrets from family or friends. Be accurate and frank in discussions. Don't deceive others. Admit your failings. Do not gossip, backbite, or tell lies. Asteya, non-stealing. Do not steal. Control your desires and live within your family's means. Do not desire what others possess. Do not misuse things you borrow. Do not gamble or fail to repay debts. Do not use others' names, words, resources, or rights without permission and acknowledgement. Brahmacharya, divine conduct. Control your desires when single, reserving sexual relations for marriage. Before marriage, use vital energies in study and after marriage in creating family success. Dress and speak modestly. Seek holy company. Avoid pornography and violence on TV, in movies, magazines, and online. Kshama, patience. Restrain intolerance with people and impatience with circumstances. Be agreeable and unhurried. Let others behave according to their nature without adjusting to you. Do not argue, interrupt, or dominate conversations. Be especially patient with children and the elderly. Remain poised even in difficult times. Dritti, steadfastness. Overcome fear, indecision, and changeableness. Stick to what you are supposed to do without getting sidetracked. Be firm in your decisions. Achieve your goals with a prayer, purpose, plan, persistence, and push. Do not complain or make excuses. Develop willpower, courage, and industriousness. Conquer obstacles. Daya, compassion. Conquer cruel and insensitive feelings toward all beings. See God everywhere. Be kind to people, animals, plants, and the earth itself. Forgive those who apologize and express their true remorse. Foster sympathy for others' needs and suffering. Help those who are weak, poor, aged, or in pain. Oppose family abuse and other cruelties. Arjava, honesty. Give up deception and wrongdoing. Obey the laws of your nation and community. Do not bribe or accept bribes. Do not cheat or deceive others. Be honest with yourself. Face and accept your faults without blaming them on others. Always be honest. Mitahara, moderate appetite. Do not eat too much. Do not eat meat, fish, shellfish, fowl, or eggs. Enjoy fresh, wholesome vegetarian foods that vitalize the body. Avoid junk and processed foods such as white sugar, white rice, and white flour. Eat at regular times and only when hungry. Do not eat in a disturbed atmosphere or when upset. Saucha, purity. Avoid impurity in mind, body, and speech. 
maintain a clean, healthy body, keep a pure, uncluttered home and workplace, act virtuously, keep good company, never use harsh or indecent language. The ten niyamas are Hri, remorse, be modest and show shame for misdeeds, recognize your errors, confess, apologize and make amends, welcome constructive criticism, resolve all contention before sleep, seek out and overcome your own faults, do not boast, shun pride and pretension. Santosha, contentment, seek joy and serenity in life. Be happy, smile, and uplift others. Live in gratitude for your health, friends, and belongings. Don't complain about what you don't have. Identify with the eternal you. Live in the eternal now and work for spiritual progress. Dana, giving. Tithe and donate to temples, ashrams, and spiritual organizations. Feed and give to those in need. Freely share your time and talents. Treat guests as God. Astikya, faith. Believe firmly in God, God's Guru, and your path to enlightenment. Trust in the scriptures and traditions. Be loyal to your lineage, one with your Satguru. Don't make friends with those who try to break your faith. Practice devotion and sadhana to build faith. Avoid doubt and despair. Ishvara Pujana, worship of the Lord. Worship and meditate daily. Offer fruit, flowers, or food daily at the home shrine. Learn a simple puja. Visit the shrine when leaving home and returning. Siddhanta Shravana scriptural listening. Study the teachings and listen to the wise of your lineage. Carefully choose a guru, then follow his path and don't waste time exploring other ways. Listen to readings and inspired talks by which wisdom flows from knower to seeker. Mati, cognition. Develop a spiritual will and intellect with your Satguru's guidance. Strive for knowledge of God to awaken the light within. Seek the lesson in each experience to understand life and yourself. Cultivate intuition through meditation. Vrata, sacred vows. Take and fulfill religious vows, rules, and observances. These are spiritual contracts with your soul, your community, and God, gods, and guru. Fast periodically. Pilgrimage yearly, uphold your vows strictly, be they chastity, marriage, monasticism, non-addiction, tithing, loyalty to a lineage, vegetarianism, or non-smoking. Japa, recitation. Recite your holy mantra daily as instructed by your guru. Bathe first, quiet the mind, and concentrate fully to let japa harmonize, purify and uplift you. Let japa quell the emotions and rivers of thought. Tapas, austerity. Practice from time to time austerity, serious disciplines, penance and sacrifice. Atone for misdeeds through penance, such as 108 prostrations or fasting. Perform self-denial, giving up cherished possessions, money or time. Path to Shiva, Lesson 41. What are our five core practices? Worship, holy days, pilgrimage, dharma, and rites of passage are the five areas of practice that Gurudeva recommended for all Hindus. In Sanskrit, they are called the Pancha Nicha Karmas. First and foremost is daily worship, upasana, 
This is the core of religious life, the soul's natural outpouring of love for God and the gods. Next is Utsava, honoring holy days, when the blessings of the deities are strongest. We join with family and community in ceremony and feasting during the major Shiva, Ganesha, and Murugan festivals each year. Monday is the Hindu holy day in the north of India and Friday in the south. On this day we attend the temple, clean and decorate the home shrine, and spend extra time in prayer, japa, and scriptural study. These are not days of rest. We carry on our usual work. Pilgrimage Tirtha Yatra is our third area of practice. At least once a year we make a special journey to a holy place. It is a complete break from our usual concerns, during which God, gods, and gurus become the singular focus. These three forms of worship, daily puja, holy days, and pilgrimage, help us manifest our inner perfection in our outer nature. Our fourth area is dharma, living an unselfish life of duty and good conduct. Here, the yamas and niyamas are our guide. Dharma includes being respectful of parents, elders, teachers, and swamis. Our fifth area of practice is rites of passage, called samskaras. These are personal ceremonies that sanctify and celebrate crucial junctures in life from birth to death. The first major samskara is the name-giving rite. Others follow, including first feeding, ear piercing, and beginning of formal study. As an adult, the most important ceremony is marriage. At death, the soul is released from the body during sacred funeral rites. Rites of passage draw us to special blessings from the devas and deities, society and village, family and friends. Path to Shiva, Lesson 42. How do we use affirmations? An affirmation is a positive declaration or assertion that we repeat regularly to bring about useful changes in our life. While repeating the words, we concentrate on the meaning and visualize and feel the desired result. Your words, visualizations, and feelings have power. They impress your subconscious mind. When they are positive, useful, and creative, they make you more secure and successful in everything you do. Affirmations must be carefully worded to gain the desired effect. The sadhana is to repeat it to yourself for a minute or two, ideally at the same time each day. Silently is good, but aloud is even better. For example, I can, I will, I am able to accomplish what I plan. Repeating this each day programs your mind with confidence and increases your willpower. But just saying the words is not enough. You must really feel, I can, I will, I am able. Imagine what it will feel like when you accomplish your goal. It is helpful to remember the feeling of success you experienced when you achieved something in the past. Positive affirmations help you face life with optimism. Negative thinking does the opposite. Many people think, I can't, I won't, I'm not able. And sure enough, they fail. Why? Because they have programmed their mind to fail. An affirmation creates the opposite effect. You see the goal clearly and feel yourself attaining it. Success follows naturally. Gurudeva's other affirmations include, I'm all right, right now. All my needs will always be met. And I am equal to any challenges I meet. Affirmation builds a positive self-concept. 
This means knowing that you are a worthy person deserving a wonderful life and fully capable of achieving it. Having such a positive concept allows us to identify with our inner spiritual nature so that we truly feel we are a divine being on a perfect path. Path to Shiva, Lesson 43 What is Sadhana? There are three dimensions to our being physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. All three need attention for optimum health. Exercise strengthens our physical body. Learning and practicing self-control expands and enhances our emotional, mental capacity. Through sadhana, spiritual practice, we exercise our spiritual nature by taking time to experience it. Most of the time we are so wrapped up in our outer nature that we are hardly aware of our deep, glorious inner reality. This can go on life after life, as many people only begin to think of greater realities when nearing the point of death. We give time to our spiritual nature by performing religious activities, ideally as a daily vigil or spiritual exercise. During this quiet time alone, we focus on life's inner purpose, which is to make spiritual progress. Puja, Japa, scriptural study, Hatha Yoga, and meditation are all forms of sadhana. Some sadhanas are yearly, such as going on pilgrimage. Some may be assigned by the Guru as a one-time practice. A popular sadhana is chanting Om 108 times each day. The 10-minute spiritual workout is becoming popular in today's busy world. These times of quiet retreat from life's hustle and bustle are underrated, their benefits overlooked. Sadhana builds willpower, faith, and confidence in oneself and in God, gods, and guru. It harnesses our instinctive intellectual nature allowing unfoldment into the superconscious realizations and innate abilities of the soul. Gurudeva noted, Through sadhana we learn to control the energies of the body and nerve system. And we experience that through the control of the breath, the mind becomes peaceful. Sadhana is practiced in the home, in the forest, by a flowing river, under a favorite tree. In the temple, in gurukulas, or wherever a pure, serene atmosphere can be found. Yoga Swami directed his devotees to follow the sadhana marga, the path of religious effort, all through life. Path to Shiva, Lesson 44, What is Yoga? Yoga, meaning union, is Hinduism's system of yoking our individual consciousness with transcendent or divine consciousness. Yoga was described by sage Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras over 2,000 years ago as a system of meditation with eight limbs or stages. Hence, it is known as Ashtanga, Eightfold Yoga. It is also known as Raja Yoga. Patanjali defined it as the restraint of mental activities. Stages 1 and 2 are Yama and Niyama. These define the spiritual lifestyle we need for success in meditation. 
The third limb is asana, meaning seat or posture, learning to sit comfortably for long periods without moving. This is achieved through hatha yoga, the postures of which balance the energies of mind and body, promoting health and serenity. The fourth stage is pranayama, regulated breathing. This is the science of controlling prana, subtle energy, through breathing techniques. Stage five is pratyahara, withdrawing awareness from the senses, emotions, and thought. Like a tortoise who withdraws its head and legs into its shell for protection, the yogi withdraws his awareness from the outside world and discovers the infinite world within. The sixth stage is dharana, concentration, focusing the mind on a single object or line of thought, not allowing it to wander. Stage seven is jhana, true meditation. Gurudeva described it as a quiet, alert, powerfully concentrated state, wherein new knowledge and insight pour into the field of consciousness. A good meditation teaches us something new about ourselves or the world. The eighth and final stage is samadhi. This is the goal of yoga, a state in which the meditator and the object of meditation are one. Over time, specialized forms of yoga have been developed. For example, Kriya Yoga focuses on breath control, mantra and mudra. Karma Yoga transforms work into worship. Bhakti Yoga is union through devotion. And in some forms of Hatha Yoga, bodily perfection is the goal. Path to Shiva, Lesson 45. What is Japa? A mantra is a sacred Sanskrit word or phrase. And repeating one's mantra while counting on beads is called Japa or Mantra Yoga. Such a magic chant forms a kind of spiritual affirmation that we repeat mentally or aloud to draw close to God. It helps us feel in perfect harmony with everything. There are many mantras. Each one honors God or one of the gods. One of Ganesha's mantras is Om Gam Ganapataye Namaha. It means praise to the Lord of Devas. Murugan's special mantra is Om Saravana Bhava. It describes the mind as a peaceful, undisturbed lake. The supreme Saiva Mantra found at the center of the Yajur Veda is Nama Shivaya, which means adoration to Shiva. Because it has five syllables, Na, Ma, Shi, Va, Ya, it is called the Panchakshara Mantra, or five-lettered chant. One of your goals as a youth should be to qualify yourself for Nama Shivaya initiation from your guru. This will give the mantra special power for you. After that ceremony, you will repeat it every day 108 times. Chanting Om Nama Shivaya connects you with millions of Shiva's devotees. Om Nama Shivaya feeds your soul, brightens your intellect, and quells the instinctive mind. Until you are initiated in Nama Shivaya, you can chant Om Saravana Bhava. Here is how to perform Japa. Sit quietly holding a strand of 108 prayer beads in your right hand. Repeat the mantra verbally or mentally. Each time you repeat it, push a bead over the middle finger with your thumb. Concentrate on the sound and its meaning as you have been taught. Keep your mind from wandering. As you chant, the devas send rays of blessings. Perform japa anywhere, in the temple, in your home shrine room, under a favorite tree, on the banks of a river, or in a remote cave. Path to Shiva, Lesson 46. What is meditation? 
Meditation is the yoga practice we use to quiet the mind, the body, and the emotions and go deep within ourselves. It is more than sitting down and thinking about things in an ordinary way. And it is not just closing the eyes and doing nothing. Meditation occurs when concentration is sustained. It is a quiet, alert, powerful state wherein new knowledge is awakened from within as you focus fully on an external object or an internal line of thought. The first goal is to sit still for a few minutes. Then sit longer until you can remain perfectly still for 10 or 15 minutes. When you are able to sit for 20 minutes without moving even one finger, your divine mind can begin to express itself. It can even reprogram your subconscious and change bad habits. The second method is to breathe regularly, nine counts in and nine counts out slowly. Our emotions and thinking are tied to our breathing. If we control breathing, we automatically quiet our emotions and thoughts. When our body is still and our mind and emotions are quiet, we can find peace and discover new knowledge inside ourselves. We become aware of the spiritual power within us. We can use that power to understand our religion, to solve problems in our life, and to be a better person. Meditation is the study of awareness, which is therefore a study of yourself and the universe. With practice, meditation becomes a door to contemplation, where you experience the highest states of consciousness and see the clear white light of your soul. If you learn to meditate, your life will be more interesting and less stressful. You will be more alive and alert, more present and able to live in the eternal now. Your thinking will be clearer and your emotions more joyful.